Hi, I'm Anthony Marinelli, and I'm here with my longtime friend, Kevin Maloney, who was the product specialist from the L.A. Synclavier store back in 1984. That's the first time we met. And I have the privilege today to be in his Synclavier closet. Kevin has three different Synclavier keyboards, and we're going to go through all the aspects of Synclavier that we can cover. And I'm going to let Kevin take it away and tell you what's going on inside that box. Great. So what we have here is this is a not quite the originally the Synclavier 2, but it is an FM or additive, an FM system, system only, no sampling. Uh, to, to get this thing fired up, what you needed to use was a floppy disk, five and a quarter inch floppy disk. It only has one little file on it. And put it in the floppy drive, close the lever, hit the little red button, and cross your fingers and wait, and it would boot up. It boot up to the keyboard, uh, and there it goes. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, it go for some reason. This one boots up and goes into record. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, so this system, uh, this system has 32 FM voices, and when we say FM, it's additive synthesis, 24 harmonics, waveform, sine wave harmonics, and then that's the carrier waveform, and then the modulator waveform is just a sine wave, and though you can modulate any of those uh, groupings of 24 harmonics. Uh, on the unit here, fans keeping it warm, <laughs> cool. Uh, there are your audio outputs. This says polyphonic sampling, but this, this is just a panel that was used. We used it, but it did not does not have the sampling in it. Uh, floppy cable that connects to the back of the floppy drive. Uh, the keyboard cable goes over to the keyboard. There were options for Winchester hard drives, which were not even SCSI hard drives yet. There was IMI drives starting with 5 megabyte, 10 megabyte, 15, 20, I think it went up to 20. Then they switched over to SCSI hard yeah, drives. Yeah, that we paid $20,000 for, <laughs> you know, 5 expensive. megabyte. And don't megabyte, drop it. Remember, megabyte. Okay. Megabyte. And not, these floppy drives started out at kilobytes. So yeah. there were 128 kilobytes on these little, you know, and that's, we also stored our sounds, our FM sounds on these little floppy disks. Yeah, discs. yeah. Because there was no other place, there was an audio, even a hard drive for sounds. Hard drives were reserved basically for samples back then, and I don't even think we could get an hour's worth of, you know, it's a monophonic sample. Right, it was mono sampling. This unit here on the bottom, we'll show that we have, we have both mono, mono sample to disk, and then there was also sample to memory stereo that they added right. later. The too. early units, just like Kevin said, though, only additive synthesis, you know, wavetable, and FM. And then this terminal port, so a serial interface that would plug into, uh, used to be the DEC VT100 uh, monitor, the green screen monitor that you've probably seen in some of the early ads and stuff. Um, later they recreated that with a little app that runs on a Macintosh. Uh, they called it a Terminator. Fun, and they just pulled that in. That was a medical diagnostics um, computer, the Able 60. Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. it had, had a, a graphic graphics uh, board in it, too, so you could run some graphics and look at waveforms and things like that. Sinclair wasn't like Yamaha or Roland. They, they couldn't just, like, invent everything and manufacture everything. So they, they pulled components together, and that, that whole part of it came from a medical diagnostic system. Yeah. Then later they added uh, MIDI, which wasn't even a thing yet. Well, actually it was, but they weren't even thinking MIDI yet. Uh, this, is, this one has a one input and four output hard, hardwired MIDI, five pinned in MIDI. Uh, you could get up to eight outputs, which was kind of extreme, but that could have been used back then more than now everything plugs into uh, virtual MIDI and things like that. But there were some great workarounds because with not having MIDI, we had a great sequencer built into the Synclavier. So we could actually do the kinds of things that you were doing later with a DAW and MIDI. We, and we'll show you that. You'll see firsthand in it. It was quite a... I don't think it's ever been beaten, really, to have a sequencer. It's like a tape recorder with fast-forward, stop, and, right. and rewind right in front of you. And then you can change pitch. You can change the sounds, just like, like MIDI on a DAW but you didn't have to deal with like a, a, a typewriter and a mouse. You could just push buttons and see what you were doing. What was really cool too was the ability, when you change, modify a sound and you recorded that sound, it was easy to swap the sound on the track that you were recording. Uh, and all those changes, all those sounds that were recorded into that sequencer, when you store it 
it all calls up. You don't have to go hurt, hunt for those sounds and look for, you know, bank yeah. one entry two. All those sounds were saved with the sequence. So we'll show you that. One. That yeah. was really a great feature that was designed in there. Sh show the filters because these, oh, yeah, these yeah. boxes didn't. So have it. FM outputs, they had balanced outputs. Uh, it was pro. Uh, since NED, New England Digital, did not want any kind of analog filters. They, people ask for them all the time, but they didn't want them. They didn't want to do it, they put in some digital filters. So there's a high, I don't even know what the frequency was, but it was a high filter, kind of took off a little bit of the edge off some of the 8-bit synthesizer, the buzziness of some of the 8-bit synthesizers, and then a kind of a, a high-mid switch, so you could get a little bit more roll off. Sometimes for bass sounds, it was good because they were really buzzy. Nowadays, people like some of the synchronizer sounds because they're buzzy, and so they're, and they have kind of that gritty kind of a sound that you can't get on the digital synthesizers now. There's no well, they're 16-bit now, so these 8-bit right. yeah. sounds had a lot of aliasing, all that really high, hashy stuff. So the filters would cut it out, or you could always run it through your own VCF, voltage control filter, or EQ it out, or something like that. But like Kevin said, we would play around with the switches depending on the sound. Sometimes for high-end sounds, we'd let it rip. Even bass sounds, we'd let, we'd let it rip with all the high-frequency junk or, or roll it off. But that was the, extents of our, the extent of our sound shaping in terms of analog <laughs> right. Shaping, right, right. Let, leave, let, let the engineer EQ yeah. it and deal with it later. Huh? Yeah. Well, so, oh, SIMPTI as well. They added SIMPTI time code, so it could it could actually generate SIMPTI if you wanted to print to tape, and then it would also synchronize and read SIMPTI time yeah. code later. Yeah, 